Hello and welcome back to another week at the Damage Report. I'm John Adarola. Big day planned, big week planned, honestly. This is gonna be a major one. Tomorrow, of course, is the debate that is gonna precede the Iowa caucuses, and then we're right into the Democratic primary. Which means that if any of these candidates want to make a major move, tomorrow is gonna be when it happens. And we'll, of course, be giving you analysis of that here on the Damage Report. Today, though, we are going to dive into Iran, both the protests that are going on right now, but also some of the pretext for the conflict that we appear to have sort of disengaged from. How much truth was actually there and what we were being told about the intelligence that led to the killing of Qasem Soleimani. We're gonna have that for you. We're gonna go on a little bit later on. Donald Trump's recent interview with Laura Ingram revealed multiple planned war crimes that he wants to engage in. And we're going to lay those out. But also the Democratic primary field has gotten one smaller with the exit of Cory Booker. We're going to do a little bit of a retrospective on his campaign to close out the hour. We also will be joined by a couple of awesome guests along the way. But before all that, let's start off with some domestic news. Donald Trump has made increasingly bold and in some cases specific references to why exactly Qasem Soleimani needed to be killed in the strike of two Thursdays ago. The problem with the claims that he's making now is that they don't appear to be buttressed by any actual intelligence and whereas in previous news cycles, Mike Pompeo has been willing to go in front of the cameras, even in press conferences, and imply that the president is saying something that is grounded in the truth. Others in his administration are not as willing to lie on behalf of the president. So I want you to take a look at this appearance recently by Mark Esper, who is talking about Trump's recent claim that four embassies were being targeted by Qasem Soleimani. Is there any truth to that? Let's see what happens. What the president said was he believed that it probably and could have been attacks against additional embassies. I shared that view. I know other members of the national security team shared that view. That's why I deployed thousands of American paratroopers to the Middle East to reinforce our embassy in Baghdad and other sites throughout the region. Probably and could have been. That mm -hmm. is, that sounds more like an assessment than a specific tangible threat with a decisive piece of intelligence. Well, the president didn't say there was a tangible, he didn't cite a specific piece of evidence. What he said is he probably, he believed- Are you saying there wasn't been. one? I didn't see one with regard to four embassies. What I'm saying is I share the president's view that probably my expectation was they were gonna go after our embassies. Okay, now bear in mind, that is Mark Esper. He is on Team Trump. He's one of the big figures in Team Trump right now. If there was any room, for him to imply that Donald Trump, any cover for Donald Trump in what he has said, Mark Esper would have employed that. There isn't, when he says he didn't see any justification for that statement, that means there was nothing there. There was nothing adjacent to there that Donald Trump or Donald Trump defenders could hide behind. Which leaves us with the, I guess, inconvenient truth or inconvenient at least for much of our national news, that Donald Trump is simply lying. And we need to call that out. And I'll explain in a minute why it's so important that we call that out. But when I say that he's lying, it's because he has been very specific in this claim. This claim that Mark Esper, Secretary of Defense, just said is not true. It's not found in any intelligence. I wanna run through a couple of the times that Trump has made this claim. Trump at a rally in Toledo said, Soleimani was actively planning new attacks and he was looking very seriously at our embassies and not just the embassy in Baghdad. So specific references to which embassies. He added in a local TV interview, plus he was going after, in our opinion, our very intelligent opinion, he was going after our embassies and things could have happened. I can reveal, I believe it probably would have been for embassies. So in all of those cases, you have Trump's normal loose language. But you also have language that is clearly designed to manipulate people into thinking that this is official. When he says, I can reveal, that's what you say when, okay, we've had serious talks, it is safe for me to reveal this information. What he's revealing there is just his opinion or his wish, what would be convenient to justify the actions that he took. But he uses language that makes it seem as this, this is the like official stance after strategizing of the Joint Chiefs and all the Pentagon officials and all of that. And so regular Americans could be forgiven for leaving this past week of Trump you know, quotes and appearances and rallies and all of that thinking, Oh yeah, no, there was a plan. There were four specific embassies that would have been destroyed if we hadn't taken out Qasem Soleimani. That is simply not the case. Mark Esper is making that clear. Now, why this is important is because right now, at least for the time being, it appears that the, the brakes have been pumped, 
okay? But Donald Trump has already brought us to the brink with Iran multiple times now. It is likely that between now and the general election, he will do so again. And so what comes out of this last little flare up with Iran is incredibly important. Donald Trump attempted to justify the actions he took with what appear to be 100% manufactured lies. If he leaves this news cycle thinking, oh yeah, I got away with it, there were no consequences, then he will do so again. And in a week or two months or six months, right on the eve of the election, I don't know. He's going to have some sort of flare up with Iran that will cause his base and perhaps some gullible centrists to rally around him the way they always do when there's international conflicts that the United States is involved in. And right now, he appears to have learned the lesson that yeah, I made it up and it was totally fine. And take a look at the casual way he talks about this dispute that I'm referencing right here. He tweeted this this morning. The fake news media and their Democrat partners are working hard to determine whether or not the future attack by Tara Soleimani was eminent. He means imminent, but he's an idiot, so we'll forgive him or not. And was my team in agreement? The answer to both is a strong yes, but it doesn't really matter because of his horrible past. So what he's saying there is, okay, I believe I have a justification, but it doesn't matter. He's talking about international law. He's talking about perhaps launching the US into another decades long war in the Middle East, but it doesn't matter. And the thing is, honestly, I'm trying to make sure that there are consequences. I'm focusing on this ad nauseum to make sure that it is as difficult as possible for him to deploy these same sorts of not even well considered lies. They're barely veiled lies to justify another conflict. But the thing is, the people who actually have the power to add consequences, you know, Democrat leadership, that sort of thing, what are they doing? I mean, there, there are good people. Don, uh, you have Bernie Sanders in the Senate, you have Ro Khan in the House, and Ro Khan is gonna be joining us on the show on Wednesday, who are attempting to clamp down on his ability to unilaterally launch some sort of conflict with Iran. But right now, that's about it, and they don't appear to have the full support of the Democratic Party in either the Senate or in the House. That is an incredibly dangerous place for us to be. Okay, hundreds of people already died in the last flare up of tensions between the US and Iran. God only knows what will happen the next time. And we are leaving this last incident with it being more likely in the future. Donald Trump and his cronies feel emboldened on this issue. That is not where we wanna be. Okay, we're gonna take a short break. We come back, way more to get to after that. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Politically, and especially looking to the future, one of the most important states by far in America right now is Texas. And so I wanna profile an organization that is attempting to push Texas in the right direction. And to that end, we are now joined by Antonio Ariano, Interim Executive Director for Jolt Action. Antonio, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, it's great to be here with you. Uh, glad to have you on. Honestly, I'm just glad to talk to anyone who is out there fighting the good fight. Tell us about uh, Jolt Action. What are what are some of the things the organization is attempting to do in Texas? 
Hey, listen, it's it's a great year to be in Texas. 2020 is going to be huge. And anybody who doesn't believe in the potential of Texas, I let them know Texas is not the problem, it's the solution. At Jolt, we're mobilizing the largest percentage of Latino census takers in modern Texas history. And we're also hitting the ground running to register the largest percentage of young Latino voters to transform Texas in 2020. It's absolutely doable. There's momentum in our state that hasn't been felt in over 40 years. And we want to make sure we capitalize on that. Okay, so tell me about training the census takers. Assuming that you have great participation in Texas in the census, it's an accurate count of all the people living there. What are some of the likely outcomes of that? So, you know, we've got to make sure that we mobilize the community. One thing that is actually really important is the fact that we have seen a ramped up intimidation tactics coming out of the White House and the governor's mansion here in the state of Texas that tried to earlier in the year last year to propose a citizenship question as you know. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's a lot of uncertainty among young Latinos. A lot of people don't know if they can trust the government or if they should even be counted. We at Jolt recognize this for what it is, an intimidation tactics that seek to strip the rights and representation from our community, and we refuse to do so. At Jolt, we are speaking to a grassroots movement of young Latinos who recognize what this is, what's happening and are ready to take action. You see, in Texas, we are soon to be the largest demographic of the state. Latinos will soon be the majority of the population in the state of Texas. And with that comes a lot of political power. We recognize that these intimidation tactics are strategic and specifically formulated to make sure that they diffuse our power politically and leave our communities without the resources and representations that we deserve. So to that end, what are what are some of the actions that your organization is taking? How are you organizing people in Texas? You know, at Jolt, we recognize that any big movement in this country requires alt art and culture. And so at Jolt, we're fusing art and harnessing the power of Latino culture to bring about this engagement. So what we're doing is we're connecting through an artist in residence program. We're hiring Texas based, Texas focused Latinx artists who are going to be creating the illustration so that young Latinos can see themselves reflected in the process and are more likely to engage. And so uh, you, you've sort of sketched out what you see potentially happening in Texas in the future. How will we know that that's working? How will we know that Texas has flipped? What are some of the ways that that might manifest politically? So here's a couple of things that we need to understand. The, the, the potential in Texas is monumental. This year in 2020, and the way you'll see these um, changes come into be is you'll see how we have the potential to elect hundreds of local progressive candidates across the state. A lot of these races are now closer than ever before and are flippable. We are nine seats away from flipping the Texas House, something that we have been working for for decades, and it can be done this election cycle. We are also within grasp of breaking the supermajority of the Texas Senate. We can expand the Texas congressional delegation. We can take out John Cornyn. Senator John Cornyn is up for grabs this election cycle. We have progressive candidates on the ballot that can make sure that we send a progressive candidate to Washington DC. And last, the election cycle can, the presidential election cycle can be defined by the Latino vote in Texas and we can win the presidency. We can win the White House with 38 electoral votes and 36 congressional seats. Texas Texas is a powerhouse and it's an untapped potential that should require an unprecedented investment to make sure that we make it happen. So uh, what's interesting is I, I agree with basically every goal that you've sketched out there. Um, now, uh, officially your organization is not affiliated with any particular party, correct? That's correct, Jolt is a nonpartisan organization. We don't represent either political party, we represent la gente. We stand up for our people. And what we do is we wanna make sure that we listen to our constituency. We represent young Latino voters. We recently conducted a report called the We Are Texas. <coughs> this analysis identified the key voting motivators for young Latinos. And those issues are what mainstream media deems as progressive issues. What young Latinos in Texas care about is number one, health care for all. Why? Because Texas leads the country with the largest percentage of uninsured people in the nation. And out of that, the biggest block are Latinos. We're literally witnessing our family members die because of their lack of access to medical treatment. Number two, comprehensive immigration reform. This is what's mobilizing Latinos to the polls. When you attack immigrants in Texas, you're attacking our families. In Texas, 
one out of every three Texans are either immigrants or children of immigrants themselves. We won't tolerate disrespect. And number three, racial equity. Our growing electoral base in Texas is young and diverse. We want an equal playing field so that everybody gets a fair shake in the Lone Star State. So uh, yeah, I love I love the focus on the particular issues. But when you when you talk to these these voters, especially the younger voters in general, how do they view the political system as a whole? How do they view American politics in general? Is I mean, these issues are obviously manifestations of their political values. But in general, what is their like their stance towards the way the system is working right now? You know, the fact is that they're very discouraged. You know, there's there's a lot of empathy that, that's happening because they don't really recognize the difference between either political party. The We Are Texas report um, actually noted that that a lot of the constituencies, young Latino voters in Texas, can't even tell the difference between Republicans and Democrats because they have been let down by both parties, historically underrepresented by both parties. And at Jolt, we recognize that. We know that there has been a lack of investment in Texas. You see the Democratic Party believes that Texas is not gonna give them the biggest bang for their buck, so they don't invest. And we have this cyclical process where candidates don't invest in Latinos because they say, well, Latinos don't vote. And because they don't invest, nobody goes and knocks on that door. And if you don't knock on that door, that person doesn't come out to vote. And we go back and forth on the cyclical process. We need to have political parties that have the courage to invest in the infrastructure that's gonna be year round investing to bring about a true base that is energized and ready to transform Texas. So I don't know if the the We Are Texas report specifically went into this, but when you say that the young voters in particular, like some of them don't even necessarily differentiate all that strongly between the two parties, they feel like neither is really representing them. Um, are there any names, any politicians from either party that come up as exceptions to this? People that young Latino voters in Texas in particular think are different in some way? Right, so no, they, they, the We Are Texas report does not identify any political candidates that um, young voters are supporting. But what I tell, what we did identify are the progressive issues that they are mobilizing around. And we're excited to see a new batch of progressive candidates this time around in the 2020 election cycle that are echoing those sentiments and are actually speaking to those progressive issues. Historically, for the past 40 years, uh, up until Beto, we haven't seen a candidate run on progressive issues in Texas. That's normally not a recipe for success, according to some. But what we've seen is that we need candidates who have the courage to run on, run on progressive issues that are gonna mobilize and activate a base that hasn't been activated before. Folks say that Texas is a red state, a conservative state. That couldn't be further from the truth. Texas is not a red state, Texas is a non-voting state. We're, we're ranking at the lowest, at the, at the bottom pole in regards to voter participation nationwide. Wide. Once we activate, engage, and mobilize this constituency into action, you will see Texas transform. And if you transform Texas, like I mentioned earlier, with 38 electoral votes, you transform America. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. If um, if somebody watching this video is in Texas, wants to get involved with the organization, how can they go about doing that? We need all hands on deck for 2020. Jolt is recruiting volunteers in Austin, Dallas, and Houston to mobilize the largest grassroots operation to flip Texas. We need your help. Go to jolttx.org for more information. And if you can contribute, this is grassroots operated. Anything you have, five bucks, 10 bucks, to help us make an impact for communities of color in Texas, go to jolttx.org slash donate. Well, Antonio, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I mean, obviously, a lot of the goals that you've sketched out for Texas, it would be pretty amazing to see any of those work out later on this year. And so, you know, thank you for what your organization is doing to try to make that happen. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. We're going to take a short break here, but stick around. Lots more to come. With Trump and many of his media boosters appearing to have backed off the most pro-war rhetoric in their stance towards Iran, it might seem to some people that, oh, okay, good, Donald Trump's gonna be reasonable on this issue. And perhaps vis-a-vis Iran, he might, although stay tuned for that. But we are still very much involved in a number of conflicts in the region. And I wanted to touch base with how Donald Trump is managing a few of them to make sure that people understand the stakes going forward when it comes to American foreign policy. Now, he was interviewed last Friday by Laura Ingram. And a few of the casual comments that he made somehow did not make 
much of a wave in the national media. And I don't understand how that is possible. I wanna show a few of them to you. Here is the first, here is what Donald Trump believes that the US's continuing involvement in Syria should end up with. Moved our troops out of Syria, on the border between Turkey and Syria. That turned out to be such a successful move, Laura. Look what happened. Now they protect their own. They've been fighting over that border for a thousand years. Why should we do it? And then they say he left troops in Syria. You know what I did? I left troops to take the oil. I took the oil. The only troops I have are taking the oil. They're protecting the oil. I took well, over we're taking the oil. oil. We're not taking well, the oil. Well, maybe we will, maybe we won't. They're I mean, protecting we, the facility. I don't know. Maybe we should take it. But we have the oil. Right now, the United States has the oil. So they say he left troops in Syria. No, I got rid of all of them other than we're protecting the oil, we have the oil. That, you know, it's 2020, so I guess that's not a big deal. That's not horrendous or shocking or making a clear promise of war crimes that he plans on committing in that region. What he was saying was so extreme, so indefensible that Laura Ingram, who is literally one of the worst people on television, she was shocked by it. And, and you know, she recovered. She attempted to give him some sort of out and he doubled down on promising to commit war crimes in Syria. So let's just be clear about this and this is something we covered before because he's made some of these comments back in October of last year. Um, energy and security experts say it's unlikely that any American companies would be interested in the enormous risks and limited profits such an arrangement would entail where they you know, move into Syria and start developing its oil. Even at its peak, Syrian oil production was modest and any short term revenue potential is severely limited by logistical challenges posed by infrastructure damaged by war, pipelines that run into unfriendly areas and the unusually low grade of the oil itself. Those are all minor concerns compared to the most important, which is that you cannot simply invade a country and then take its natural resources. That is pillaging, it is a war crime, it's not allowed. This is Ryan Goodman, former special legal counsel for the Department of Defense saying, US military commanders who engaged in pillaging Syria's oil would risk criminal liability under the US War Crimes Act. The international rules of war were designed to deter nations from engaging in predatory wars to see the, seize other countries' natural resources. Now, this is something that America and our empire have done for a very long time, obviously. They usually at least had the, the instincts to hide that that's what they're doing. Donald Trump not only can't hide it, but he just repeats it over and over like he's having some sort of weird tick in his brain. He just kept saying, we're taking the oil, we're taking the oil, we're taking the oil. He's too dumb to know that it's not even good quality oil and there's not much. It wouldn't be worth it even if we were doing that. But we certainly shouldn't do that because it's not just immoral but also illegal, okay? And perhaps it's a good thing, I guess in some way, as sick as all of the consequences of Donald Trump being president have been, that he's going to make it this clear to people that when we send troops into other countries, very often it is for this sort of self-serving goal. Not self-serving from the point of view of the American people because they won't benefit in any way even if we were to steal their oil. But for international oil companies, it's beneficial. Them having a guarantee of access to natural resources is a good thing. Doesn't benefit the American people. But it can, in the right circumstances, benefit these international corporations who own most US politicians, including Donald Trump. That has become as clear as it will ever be. And I guess maybe too clear for the American media, not sexy enough at this point. He said that over and over. It's the ultimate clip. But they didn't care, it wasn't a story over the weekend. It's like, oh, US promises that they're gonna pillage the natural resources of another country, ho hum, let's move on. No, let's not move on. Let's make clear to the American people that this is the consequence of allowing this sort of politician to maintain control of American foreign policy. It, it, it has seemed to me, and it's been very frustrating throughout the Democratic primary so far, that questions of foreign policy, questions of the stance of the American military, the future of spending on the American military has not really been apparently a big motivator in terms of who is being supported in this primary. The fact, for instance, that Joe Biden was so supportive of the Iraq war hasn't really seemed to hurt him. But can you really blame people when the stakes in this area are just cast in the side? They're put in the shadows, we don't focus on them. So of course people are not gonna be picking who they support in the Democratic primary based on that. The media acts as if it's a secondary concern. But this isn't the only other area. Let's, let's move to one other thing that Trump said in there that I think should scare a lot of people. 
Donald Trump, Donald Trump is very clear that when he sends troops abroad, he wants to be paid for it as if it's some sort of product that he manufactures. That was made as clear as it's ever been in a recent interview. We're sending more to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia is paying us for it. You know, we're doing something that nobody's ever done. I said to Saudi Arabia, we have a very good relationship with Saudi Arabia. I said, listen, you're a very rich country. You want more troops? I'm going to send them to you, but you've got to pay us. They're paying us. They've already deposited $1 billion in the bank. We are going to help them. But these rich countries have to pay for it. South Korea gave us $500 million. They never gave us, they gave us $500 million. I said, you gotta help us along. We have 32,000 soldiers in South Korea protecting you from North Korea. You've gotta pay. And they gave us $500 million. That is sick, that's all it is. Every right thinking human being should watch that and think, this person should not be allowed any control, let alone supreme unilateral control over what happens to US soldiers. And the weird myth that nobody really wants to bring up, they keep saying, like implying that Donald Trump, he supports the troops and they support him. Even though when you look at polls, like more than 50% of American service members don't support Donald Trump. His approval rating among soldiers is very low. And honestly, is that surprising at all? If you were a soldier, let alone a soldier perhaps serving in the Middle East right now, if you saw that interview, what would you think of Donald Trump? What would you think of your commander in chief that he views you as like a product like any other, like one of his condos or a candy bar or a video game? Yeah, if you want this, we'll give it to you, but you gotta pay us. We'll send soldiers to Saudi Arabia to protect Saudi Arabia if we get paid. Does any American support that? Does anyone actively serving in the US Armed Forces support that? Is that what we think our military should be used for? Nobody supports that. And that is why Donald Trump on this issue is so weak, even though the media goes out of their way to protect him by ignoring these sorts of issues, by pretending that he has a soldier's back. It's infuriating, it's maddening. And look, what I wish I could say is that this is one major thing that we should focus on in this election, that it should be about the future of the American military, our funding priorities, where it's deployed, effectively, a, a, a referendum on American empire. I wish that we could have that. I don't think that we're gonna have that. I don't think that almost anyone is seriously talking about about anything wider than one particular blow up. Like the situation with Iran that developed over the course of the past two weeks. There was a lot of media coverage of it, but not of its implications, not of placing it in a context, either in terms of the current state of American involvement in international conflicts, let alone in the historical context of how we have deployed our military in the past. What I wish we could have was a serious, long conversation as a nation about what our soldiers are doing abroad, where they're deployed. Why is it that we have bases in over 100 countries? Does anyone even acknowledge that, let alone understand why that needs to be the case? Why are we spending countless hundreds of billions of dollars every single year? What, so that we can make a profit off of Saudi Arabia? If they want to respond with that, then let's have them have that conversation. I honestly wish that we could have like let's have a, a, a joint commission, Senate and House, and let's have the Joint Chiefs, let's have the head, the, the, the Mark Esper on the Capitol, and let's go through every base. Let's go through every conflict we're involved in. Let's have an actual dissection of what our military is doing to justify the amazing amount of money that we spend on it every single year. Especially at a time where we're talking about how we can't afford any of our domestic priorities. If we want to do that, if we want to be involved in Germany and South Korea and Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Yemen and all of these places, let's have them make the case and let's have the American people actually judge once and for all. Is this what we want or is this what we've ended up with and we've tolerated? I wanna have that conversation, I don't think we're going to. And at a time where hypothetically between now and the general election, we could still end up in a shooting war with Iran, we desperately need to have this conversation. But we won't, even when Donald Trump tees it up for us with comments about pillaging the natural resources of other countries, about selling American soldiers as if they're mercenaries, they're not mercenaries. No American wants that, but no American gets to be even be involved in this conversation, unfortunately. Okay, I wish that we had more time, we don't. We're gonna move on, okay, we're gonna come back. Huge protests going on in Iran right now. We're gonna be joined by an expert who's gonna break it down after this.
This morning, fairly massive protests continued in Iran. And we're joined now by an Iranian American journalist and media analyst to to make sense of all of this. Nagar Mordazavi, welcome to the Damage Report. Thanks for having me. Uh, very glad to have you here. So, give us a little bit of context to uh, these recent protests. What is what is um, uh, like uh, stimulating uh, this new action? So, the very last round of protests in the past few days, as you've probably heard the news, is because an Iranian missile, um, as the Iranian officials say, accidentally or due to a human error, shot down a civilian airplane, a Ukrainian flight that killed 176. Civilians, most of them Iranians, some children on board, students, graduate students who were moving to Canada or studying in Canada. Most people uh, were basically spending their New Year holiday in Iran for weddings, for uh, family gatherings, and they were returning back to Canada via Kiev, Ukraine, and this plane was shut down. The government denied that it was hit by a missile for three days. Uh, there were so many rumors and conspiracies in Iranian media. And then finally, after three days, officials accepted, acknowledged that it was hit down by hit by a missile, shot down by a missile, um, and apologized and promised to do an investigation. So the actual catastrophe of hitting a civilian plane, basically letting a civilian flight be in the air at the night of an operation, the retaliation operation, Iran against the U.S., and then also the lying and the denials for three days after that has caused this very raw anger. Uh, many students uh, of Iranian universities that have lost their friends uh, on the flight basically took charge, took the lead of these protests, and we've seen them happening in multiple cities in Iran for third day in a row. Uh, let, let me ask you a question about the, the the time that it took for them to acknowledge what had actually happened. So apparently, the Ukrainian government had photos showing fairly clear shrapnel damage that would be hard to deny as being some sort of mechanical flaw. Um, in, in your view, the the time that they took, are they are they being responsible in checking all options, or was it fairly clear very early on from what they knew what had actually happened, and it simply became an untenable position to not admit what the truth was? I'm not a hundred percent sure because of the lack of transparency from the government side, which is also this other problem. There's what seems clear is that. There was disagreement within the highest political echelons in Iran. Some wanted to continue with the denials, with the lie, basically, and some were adamant in getting it out. And uh, apparently, that's one reason that contributed to this. And to be frank, three days is not a very long time to just, you know, keep quiet or wait for the uh, result of an investigation. If they had said nothing, if they hadn't denied it, or if they didn't come out with very strong statements that were basically lies. Um, I don't think this this much anger would be targeted at the government uh, if they just said, hey, listen, we're waiting for an investigation, for example, we're going to let you know in two, three days. But the problem is that they kept lying. They pressured the media. State media was putting out these denials. And some government officials are now coming out and saying, we didn't even know. This is the information that was given to us. Not 100% of the government force knows what exactly happened. But there were definitely people who, who were in the know and uh, they didn't share it with whoever was denying it. So that's that's definitely a problem. As far as the Ukrainians, again, I'm not 100% sure. The whole tra- uh, situation is not very transparent. I know Iranians were inviting the Ukrainians for the investigation. Uh, it was announced early on because it was a Ukrainian flight. And it was known that this eventually will get out because this is an international flight, because other countries are involved. Many of these people were Canadian citizens or residents. So the Canadian government was also very much involved in this. So sooner or later, uh, basically, it would have come out. But the fact that they denied it and they uh, put out lies for three days is also something that's making people very angry and uh, is this loss of trust, basically, in the government. And uh, you know, I, I know that not, not everyone is the same, but to, to the extent that we can know, do the protesters seem to accept that it was actually an accident, human error, however uh, it's going to be framed? What do they actually want to happen in the future? Well, the protesters are asking for resignations, which I think is a natural 
uh, response. I'm not sure if we're going to see resignations, at least in officials that are high up. But um, hopefully we will, because this is a catastrophe that shouldn't have happened. Um, the other perspective is that, yes, this might have been a human error. And what's very interesting is a similar incident, actually, that happened in 1988 when a U.S. Navy warship shot down, again, an Iranian civilian flight. 290 people on board died, 66 children included over the Persian Gulf. Basically, again, due to human error, as the, as the Americans later said, taking it for a uh, for a fighter jet basically approaching the warship. So would this type of human error happen in an atmosphere of war? Yes, possible. It's happened in the past. But why did the Iranians, who made the decision of keeping an airport in a capital of a country that has just launched this operation, why keep that open? Why did a dozen civilian flights, commercial planes basically flying over Tehran? As the military has explained, they were in highest alert. They say they were seeing hostile behavior in the airspace around them. Their radars were picking up things that they imagined would be cruise missiles approaching them. So when you're in that state, the natural uh, response that people are expecting is to close down uh, commercial flights, which they failed to do. You know, that's not a human error. That's yeah. just the mismanagement and, and a bad decision that then leaves the door open to such um, such incidents that could be human error or could not. You know, the lack of transparency is also something that um, makes people wonder of all these conspiracies. I, I also, I, I, while we have you on, I wanted to know, um, whenever I see news, um, like Western news of things like protests in, in Iran right now, um, when it's filtered through the American media lens, I never know how much I can trust the way they're portraying the size or scale or intent of the protests, um, especially with the, the the tense situation between the U.S. and Iran right now, the predisposition of the U.S. media towards being supportive of, of foreign conflicts. What are what are some things that people in America or in the West right now should know about these sorts of movements in Iran? What are some misconceptions that they that they might have come to accept? Well, this is a great point. I also don't want to lump all American media together. I have friends who work for. For example, the New York Times or the Washington Post, and they're doing excellent reporting on what's happening in Iran. Some of them even far away from the US here. They don't have access on the ground, but they're doing excellent reporting. But for example, you go on Fox News, you turn on Fox News, and you see a completely separate image. Or even uh, the US government, you see State Department officials now chiming in, for example, on Twitter, and some people are taking that as news or analysis of what's happening on the ground. And to just to give you a clear example, last week after the assassination of Awesome Soleimani, when Iranians took to the street in millions to basically uh, commemorate a general or oppose uh, this US act, that didn't seem like Iranian population in the State Department, the White House basically tried everything they can to deny the fact that these were Iranians, uh, try to portray it as something that's orchestrated or engineered by the government or by the regime, which is not true. And then this week when you see these protesters, all of a sudden President Trump jumps on um, this political football calls them these brave Iranian protesters. They're very brave and it's good to support them. But just the message that's coming sounds so much political as if it's only, um, um, they're only cheered on basically when they're uh, in line with what President Trump's policy in Iran is, the hawkish policy in Iran. So if there's anti-regime chants on the street, he's going to cheer them. But if there's millions of Iranians who oppose his policy as hawkish, uh, maximum pressure, then it's going to be either ignored or tried in any way to deny. And that's, I think, very problem problematic here from the administration, which also trickles down to some media, of course, not all. Yeah, yeah, and, and a lot of the media will not have a particular amount of expertise in the region. And uh, it's very of easy course. to think, it's very easy to think that a population thinks one thing, but like any country, there are very large groups of people that disagree on very fundamental things. And so that's Exactly, we had, uh, just to make this quick point, we had, I live here in downtown Washington. There was the crowd for the inauguration of President Trump here in downtown Washington. The next day, more population came out for the Women's March in the same exact street. All of them are Americans. They have very different polarizing views, but to just deny one one side of the population or the other one is, um, you know, not very factual. Yeah. Well, uh, for that reason, we appreciate you joining us and uh, helping break down the situation. Uh, Nagar Mordazavi, Iranian American journalist and media analyst. Thank you once again for joining us. Thanks for having me. We're gonna take one last break here. When we come back, Cory Booker is now out. We're gonna look back at his race after this.
And then there were 12, I think, this announcement this morning that Cory Booker would be dropping from the Democratic primary was pretty surprising, actually. He'd given no indication that his campaign was coming to an end. But this morning, indeed, he tweeted, it's with a full heart that I share this news. I'm suspending my campaign for president. To my team supporters and everyone who gave me a shot, thank you. I am so proud of what we built. And I feel nothing but faith in what we can accomplish together. There is, as there always is in this sort of case, a video that was produced for it as well. We're gonna show you just a small section, here it is. Today I'm suspending my campaign for president with the same spirit with which it began. It is my faith in us, my faith in us together as a nation, that we share common pain and common problems that can only be solved with a common purpose and a sense of common cause. So now I recommit myself to the work. I can't wait to get back on the campaign trail and campaign as hard as I can for whoever is the eventual nominee and for candidates up and down the ballot. But for now, I wanna say thank you. Campaigning over this last year has been one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. Meeting you, meeting people across this country who believe, who know that we may have challenges right now in our nation, but together we will rise. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about his campaign, but first, is it weird to say that I think that videos like that are one of the weirder things about campaigning? I like, so you had like, it must have taken a couple of days, right, to put it together, but everybody has to pretend that it's still going on. And it's like the music is so upbeat. I, and I get it, I get it. Like you, you, wanna, you wanna maintain like all the people that support you, all the people that work for you, you want them to give something like to feel good about as you leave, but you're still leaving. I don't know, humans are weird sometimes. Um, so here's the thing, Cory Booker, like, there are, there are some candidates in this race that were about an issue, um, you know, UBI or climate change. He was definitely like the optimism guy. Like he was upbeat, he was happy, he thought big things could happen, but he didn't catch on. And honestly, like, look, I didn't, I didn't support Cory Booker. I've already endorsed Bernie Sanders, that same caveat that I always give. But I did think that he was going to do better. Um, I think there is something about him that, you know, like you, absent getting deep into the issues, which obviously I disagree on certain issues, especially financial regulation with Cory Booker. Um, he is a very like uplifting sort of positive sort of force. He always seems optimistic about what can be done. And I thought that especially in as dark a time as we're in, that that would catch on more. Obviously not with me or people who think about politics the way that I do, but I thought that it would be more popular in general, like to see that like out of all of those sort of like like the senators that are sort of centrist but pitching themselves as progressives that like Buttigieg would be the one that that rises like obviously Biden's going to do fine and you know Warren's a big force and everything but of the people who are a little bit lower tier I thought that Cory Booker would actually be the one that did well it was surprising to see that he didn't catch on um now looking forward important questions especially as we're just a couple of weeks out it seems from the Iowa caucuses um, he said in that speech there, I look forward to getting out there on the campaign trail and fighting for whoever ends up being the nominee. But the question is, is this like a Castro move where he leaves, but very soon after he endorses? I think that that might be the case. I think that Cory Booker, I would not be shocked if maybe right in advance of the debate or maybe right in advance of the Iowa caucus, if he came out and supported probably Warren. I mean, it's not impossible that he could endorse Joe Biden. But I think that that Cory Booker, like you could wake up and the news could be Cory Booker endorses Elizabeth Warren. I think that that would not be a very surprising turn right there. Um, and, I, and I do think that as maybe he's still angling for VP, that could be a thing that could work. I could see him and Elizabeth Warren. Obviously, it's not, it's not necessarily intended for me on the issues, but I could see that being a big thing. And also, just one optimistic note, um, this was one of the, the campaign endings that that everybody else in the campaign has been very gracious about. And I like to see that. I know that we're supposed to tear everyone to shreds when these things end. But you know what? There are worse people in American politics than Cory Booker. Let's try to bear that in mind. Okay. Okay, thank you for joining me throughout the show. Um, you know, I promise to eventually get healthy. We'll see if it happens by tomorrow. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.